40 years ago, in 1984, the seemingly unstoppable slasher subgenre had hit a wall. Audiences have become largely tired of the same tropes getting rehashed time and again, both in their favorite franchises and the usually cheaply made imitators. But two unexpected hits in the fall of 84 proved there was plenty of life left in the slasher, with proper tweaks, of course. What's up, watchers? C.T. Reese here once again, and I'm just giddy to dig into one of the all-time great sci-fi slasher movies from master filmmaker James Cameron, The Terminator. This is without a doubt my favorite James Cameron film. That's right, I said it. And I'd argue that The Terminator, along with Nightmare on Elm Street, reinvigorated a subgenre that was stuck treading a path of well-worn tropes and in desperate need of rejuvenation. And as always, this is a spoiler-filled talk, so if you're looking to check out The Terminator first, I did leave some links in the description to find it. So let's take a moment and think about what was going on with the slasher subgenre in 1984. Halloween as a franchise was completely stalled out. Michael Myers had apparently been killed in the hospital fire at the end of Halloween 2, 1981, and 1982 season of The Witch. Well, that wasn't even a slasher, and it really wasn't well received at the time. There wouldn't be another Halloween movie until 1988. It's really a franchise that took most of the decade off. Now, perhaps feeling that the slasher genre was starting to fade, Friday the 13th had also just eliminated its killer in a hockey mask, Jason, with its fourth entry, The Final Chapter, in April of 84. And if you look back at the summer of 84, the slasher is largely absent, especially compared to the previous few years, which saw movies like Prom Night, My Bloody Valentine, The Prowler, Taurus Trap, The Burning, and literally dozens more. And all these movies shared much in common, featuring a killer, usually in a mask or with some sort of distinct look, picking off a group of high school or college age youngsters one by one until finally seeing defeat at the hands of a final girl character who is often aided by a male character who may or may not have to sacrifice himself to ensure the final girl's victory. And the killers usually have a signature weapon of choice. These movies tend to take place either out in the woods or in a cozy suburb. And if there are any local authorities present, well, they're usually either useless or actively hindering our hero's progress towards their goal of defeating evil. But I'm really getting away from my main point here, which is looking at the Terminator as the perfect slasher film. So just using Halloween as a reference, Linda Hamilton's Sarah Connor character is the Laurie Strode final girl analog. Arnold's Terminator is, of course, Michael Myers' equivalent. And the Dr. Loomis character, well, that's Michael Bean's Kyle Reese. No relation, of course. Now, James Cameron, he's been very open in his appreciation for John Carpenter and that the Terminator took a slasher template inspired specifically by Carpenter's Halloween, in that we're dealing with a force of nature type killer, stalking down an innocent young woman and killing anyone in its path. Of course, this time it's all done through the lens of a time traveling sci-fi reinvention that will continue to play with many of the other beats and tropes that had been established with the slasher genre. James Cameron's abilities as a filmmaker and attention to detail are already on full display in this early entry of his, and he really gets away with some things that I think lesser skilled filmmakers probably couldn't. For example, he kicks off the Terminator by giving us a taste of the future war of man versus machine and the environment that produced both the Terminator and Kyle Reese. And this is just the first of a number of sequences that take place in the future using full-sized and miniature shots that still look great, but more importantly, don't bog down the pace of the film at all. They add a level of immersion in the story that would have been lacking with their absence. And also, including the killer's origin, well, that had become common for the genre by now, and this time we're seeing the baddie come from the future. And in keeping with another slasher tradition, this cybernetic killer has to take out a few victims unrelated to our main cast of characters early on, just so the audience knows how bad of a dude we're dealing with here. The Terminator accomplishes this soon after his arrival from the future as he dispatches a group of punks, including Bill Paxton, so he can cover up all that man meat of his. He then goes and takes out how one of my favorite character actors of the time, Dick Miller, while arming up with his signature weapons at the gun store. Yeah, it's usually some sort of bladed weapon like Michael Myers and his kitchen knives or Jason and his machetes, but there's no denying that shotguns and automatic firearms are the Terminator's signature weapons of choice. So from there, he hits up a phone book to start tracking down all the area's Sarah Connors, and before this movie's even hit the 17 minute mark, the Terminator chalks up his fourth victim and 
first Sarah Connor, gunning her down right in her home. And one thing to note is that the kills in the Terminator are actually very light on the gore. James Cameron makes a very conscious and probably somewhat practical decision considering the MPAA at the time, and he eschews the trend for more gore, instead exchanging it for more action. I think keeping the gore lighter actually allowed him to get away with more violent scenes overall. Much like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween had done, letting the camera focus on the face of the killer or the victim rather than the gore, that can be even more impactful as it takes advantage of the audience's own imagination. Now, meanwhile, Kyle Reese, he's also arrived from the future and almost immediately has a run-in with the cops. Of course, he's way too slick for them, and after a short chase inside of a department store, he comes out ahead of the game, having not only managed to secure some clothing, but also a shotgun from a nearby patrol car. And lastly, there's the Sarah Connor we care about. She's just clocking in for a day of waitressing. And I really appreciate just how downright normal but low-key resilient she's shown to be in these early scenes. She has a long day at work with kids putting ice cream in her pockets and news reports of someone with her same name being killed. You're dead, honey. But she's not gonna let that get her down. She's even determined to have a good evening out solo after getting stood up by your would-be date through an answering machine message. And this is really where James Cameron starts to play around with some of the traditional slasher tropes. After Friday the 13th, the forest setting became almost a staple of the slasher genre due to its ability to feel so isolating. The Terminator goes the exact opposite direction. Sarah Connor sees another news report about a second woman with her name being killed, and the feelings of fear and isolation immediately set in. She's surrounded by people in the city, but can't trust anyone. And with Reese looking all stalkerish outside, that only makes things worse as she heads into the dance club to try and get in touch with the police. Now, a staple of the second act in Slashers is the antagonist has to up the body count and get some stalking in. The final girl can be anywhere from blissfully unaware that anything's wrong, all the way up to fully involved, but not yet killed. And we get a little bit of both here as the Terminator makes his way to Sarah's apartment and takes out her roommate and her date, only discovering that Sarah Connor is actually at the dance club thanks to the answering machine that was so deftly set up earlier in the movie. And James Cameron's about to turn up the action to points rarely seen in horror before 1984. He borrows from the action movie template that he himself helped solidify in the 80s, which calls for a handful of action-filled set pieces to hang the rest of the movie around. The nightclub shootout scene and the parking lot car chase that follows lets us know where everyone in this movie stands right now. The Terminator, a relentless killer who will continue to get up even after being shot or thrown from a moving vehicle. Reese, he's determined to the point that some might call him crazed, but he's also overwhelmed at the strength of his foe and the importance of his mission. And Sarah Connor is reluctantly along for the ride, trying desperately to stay alive and wrap her head around a killer and a protector, both sent from the future for her. Once Sarah and Reese are taken to the police station for protection and mental evaluation, respectively, we get to see Reese really go full Dr. Loomis. It's just him and me. Now, one of Dr. Loomis's defining characteristics in Halloween is his fear of what Michael Myers is capable of, which makes him appear to most of the people he encounters as some sort of crazed lunatic himself. The Halloween franchise would continue to lean into this trope when it brought back Mike Myers and Doc Loomis for its fourth entry. Friday the 13th would also eventually adopt Tommy Jarvis into this role for part six, Jason Lives. Even Nightmare on Elm Street would bring back the final girl Nancy Thompson from the first movie to sort of play its own riff on the Loomis trope in Nightmare 3 Dream Warriors. Now, all these characters have adopted a life's mission of stopping the evil threatening the world they're in, and they're going to sacrifice a little bit of their own sanity in the process of such a one-note goal. The singular goal of these characters also acts as a mirror for the stalking killer who also has only one goal in mind. And although Sarah and Reese are surrounded by armed cops, this is a slasher movie after all, so authority figures here, they're destined to be rendered next to useless. But we do get a break from the strong silent killer trope when the Terminator drops one of the franchise's most iconic lines. I'll be back. And once he crashes through the front of that station, no one inside has a prayer. He stalks around the police station, taking out everyone he encounters with ease, leaving Reese and Sarah to do the only smart thing and run. Now, I'd argue that the Terminator helped to cement another trend in slashers that was picked up by major franchises in the 80s. That is, having the killer be absolutely huge. For example, 
A five foot nine Dick Warlock played Michael Myers in Halloween 2, but when the character comes back for Halloween 4, he's being played by an almost six foot three George Wilbur. And the massive Kane Hodder, he's famous for playing Jason in the later Friday the 13th entries as well. Before Terminator, you could just give these guys superhuman strength, and for the audience, that was enough. But now, they had to look bigger than a pro wrestler to properly complete the look. And I have to believe that Arnold in this role had a little something to do with that. So having escaped the police station and now on the run, it's time for Reese and Sarah to settle down at a motel, make some pipe bombs, and then make some love. Completely flipping the final girl doesn't have sex trope on its head. But seriously, even though their time together is brief, the connection between Sarah and Reese comes across as genuine thanks to Michael Bean and Linda Hamilton's chemistry. It's also a sex scene that has massive implications for the film, since this is the conception of John Connor, who will go on to lead the resistance and send Reese back to protect his mother. So, no sex in a slasher, unless it's to conceive the future leader of mankind. I can accept that. But we still have a number of slasher standbys to both stick to and subvert as the Terminator catches up to Sarah and Reese at that motel. Now, this kicks off the final stock of the movie that begins a chase scene where pipe bombs, a pickup truck sideswipe, and even getting taken out head on by an 18 wheeler aren't enough to keep this cyborg down. The Terminator just jacks that 18 wheeler for his own use and the chase is back on until Reese reaches down into his bag of slick tricks and manages to hit the gas tanker with one of those pipe bombs. And when that truck explodes, it leads to both a slasher standby and a subversion all in one. The standby, of course, is the scene where you think, surely the bad guy's finally been defeated because there's only so much damage anything can take after all. But of course, in true slasher fashion, the Terminator will rise up from the ashes of his human flesh for one last go at our final girl. And for me, this is where the subversion comes in as well. Many of the great slashers have masks that make their killers instantly recognizable. Michael Myers in Halloween, Jason's hockey mask, the My Bloody Valentine Miners mask. More recently, we had Johnny's old firefighting helmet from In a Violent Nature. In The Terminator, the human mask is melted away to fully reveal the endoskeleton underneath. We finally see the Terminator's real face and it's surely more terrifying than anything Sarah Connor could have ever imagined. This is the Terminator's mask reveal, and I can't think of a better one in really any slasher movie that's come before or since. Like all great slasher masks, the design would remain iconic, ensuring that Arnold was going to lose at least some of his face every time he'd go on to reprise this role going forward. And as the chase moves from the outside into a nearby factory, the Terminator exchanges its Halloween underpinnings for something more akin to Halloween 2. Much like Dr. Loomis seemingly sacrifices himself at the end of that film to destroy Michael Myers, Reese pulls a similar move here when he gets up close and personal, using the last pipe bomb to blow the Terminator to pieces while sacrificing his own life in the process. The twist here is that this cyborg still will not die, and Sarah has to go through one last endeavor, luring the legless robot underneath a hydraulic crusher where she can finally drop a badass one-liner of her own before taking it out for good. You're a terminated fucker. Following that final battle, there's a very unslasher-like sort of epilogue scene. It shows Sarah's relocated to Mexico, she's pregnant with the future savior of mankind, and she's on her own mission now to ensure that they'll both be prepared for the role that fate has assigned them. And how could I forget? Ever since Halloween dropped this little ditty, No great slasher would be complete without reprising an immediately recognizable and preferably synth-driven theme song from the opening credits. And also, like all the most popular slasher movies, The Terminator went on to spawn a slew of sequels over the coming decades that would vary wildly in their quality and in their willingness to stick to established canon, including multiple rebooted timelines. The influence of the Terminator franchise on the slasher genre helped to reinvigorate it by valuing action over gore. It exchanged slow, stalking sequences out for high-speed car chases. Silent stabs were now theater-rocking gunshots. It found the perfect balance of flipping well-worn tropes on their head while retaining the core aspects of what makes a slasher film a slasher film. In the arrival of A Nightmare on Elm Street, less than a month later, that would give the genre even more to play with after Freddy showed the world that even slasher killers can have a bit of a personality. 
But while the Terminator also showed that slasher genre didn't have to be so formulaic and that aspects of the genre could work elsewhere. Actually, another Schwarzenegger classic Predator took the idea of an almost unkillable, slasher-like alien hunter and dropped the concept into a testosterone-filled 80s action flick. So 40 years later, the Terminator still holds up incredibly well, thanks to the detailed eye of filmmaker James Cameron and the career-making performances of its trio of stars. This is Cameron's leanest film, clocking in at just over an hour and 45 minutes, and for me, it's the most rewatchable film in his catalog, easily earning a 9 out of 10 rewatchability score for me. It's a movie I'm happy to revisit anytime, as it's just perfectly paced, and I can't get enough of this early Schwarzenegger role. He'd go on to play the hero so often, it's just really fun to see him have his turn as the villain. And if you had fun watching this look back on The Terminator, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit those like and subscribe buttons. I've got retrospective takes like these coming out every week, and there are some movies coming out over the next few weeks that I'm really excited to review. I'm looking at you, Maxine. So you're not going to want to miss out on all that. Until next time, don't forget to keep it rad.